tactical simulation at its best. Realistic 3D environment. Accurate interface. Superb gameplay. In 1989, Microprose programmers put together all these attributes to produce one of the coolest simulations so far. Fire. M1 Tank Platoon. Based on the then untried M1 Abrams main battle tank, it excelled in almost everything. Realism. Playability. Intense action. And most of all, tactical gameplay. No wonder it quickly became a major milestone for military simulation games. Back then, I didn't own any PC yet at home. But a class friend had one. An Abstrad PC1640 with an 8MHz 8086 CPU, EGA display, and PC speaker for sound. His parents had bought him only one game so far, and this was... M1 Tank Platoon. Not a bad choice. It also was one of the most expensive of all games in the stores at that time, and a significant part of their family's monthly budget went into it. They didn't have many financial resources, but they had very strict moral standards, so they didn't even think about software piracy as an option. And so it was that I first played M1 Tank Platoon on this machine. The game was an outstanding sim, one of the first to focus on tanks, and certainly the first ever to allow you to control a platoon as well as to micromanage four different positions in each tank. But since this was also the first sim that I saw to provide external views, as we said back then, with filled 3D. The groundbreaking effect was multiplied. I was totally mesmerized. M1 instantly became my best game so far. <coughs> Except Dungeon Master only. And that sang a lot. And this remained so for several months. Until I discovered F-19 Stealth Fighter the following year. Which replaced it in the simulations category. Can you imagine seeing this bad guy as your very first MS-DOS game? To me, it propelled the PC right up to the forefront of the most wanted machines, just because of one game. M1 Tank Platoon was also released on the Amiga and Atari ST. This is the ST version. A very good port. And this time, you get real sound effects. Impressive, without comparison with the poor PC speaker sounds. As for graphics, it's almost identical to the DOS version in EGA 16 colors mode. Animation 
animation is very decent. <coughs> Interestingly, I didn't come across this game on the ST back in the day. Though it's a fact I played many games on that machine, I discovered this version only recently, and it's a shame. It really rocks. As always with Microprose, the thick and heavy user manual is in fact a book, and a very good one about Armored Warfare. Back then, the M1 Abrams hadn't been around for too long as the US main battle tank, nor was the Soviet T-80 in the Red Army, so this was about modern, actual and somewhat mysterious weapons. The mightiest armored beasts in the US Army and the USSR. Thrilling! The manual is well written, full of sketches about your own tanks, their onboard instruments, platoon tactics, and a lot of other military vehicles. It's not only a technical, but also a historical and military reference, with plenty of unit organization charts. It provides a great perspective on both NATO and the Warsaw Pact. An entertaining and extremely instructive read that is already worth the money, even without the game. Another unique touch from Microprose is the keyboard overlay. If you know of any other publisher that did the same, please tell me in the comments. Although not indispensable, you could just learn the keys from the manual. It helps you make your first steps into the game. And even more important, it makes your keyboard look like a real control panel, which adds the professional experience of the sim. When you launch the game, you first need to select your display. VGA 256 color mode was already available in 1989, but most PCs were using EGA 16 colors. As for sound cards, AdLib was your only choice. And since this was even less common than joysticks, the vast majority of PC players would enjoy the wonderful PC speaker sounds during the game. One would ask the standard configuration players, with such unimpressive graphics and sounds, what makes this game stand out? What do you find in it? <laughs> Rookie question. Look beyond your nose. See the game in action. 
The truth is out there. It's not a shooter, man. It's a first-class tactical simulation. The real answer is that M1 is a fantastic sim. Though beginners might find it difficult to play at first, but if you invest some time in it, you'll be largely rewarded. M1 Tank Platoon puts you in charge of four Abrams heavy tanks. Team tactics play a very important role in the game, and it begins with tank crews. These consist of four members. Commander, Gunner, Loader, and Driver. Each of them has his own stats and skills, and after each successful engagement, you can reward worthy crew members with promotions and medals. And since you have four tanks in your platoon, that means 12 persons to micromanage. When I played the game, back in the day, this part was one of my favorites. Introducing a touch of roleplay and human factor into a technical simulation was a great idea. The game menu lets you choose between practice and actual wartime operations, with different levels of difficulty. At the highest one, your Soviet opponent will give you a very hard time. You'll need to be super careful if you want your entire platoon to make it back to the base. In this very well-designed simulation, the tactical maps of the battle area is your primary interface. Here you can give orders to friendly units, as well as taking control of a single tank, assuming the role of any of the crew members. This means the game can be played more like an action simulation game, or like a tactical strategy one. Depending on the mission, you can be allocated support units in addition to your four Abrams tanks. These include mortars, light fighting vehicles, artillery, recon, attack helicopters, and older M60 tanks. You can give them orders via the tactical map. But you can't control them directly like you do with the tanks of your main platoon. This is not 2020 yet, when you can jump into any single vehicle you come across in the battlefield. However, you do have the ability to change the viewpoint to a supporting unit to get a recon from its perspective, which is often very useful. After you're done practicing with static or moving targets, you can follow up with actual engagements. These can be single or the full campaign, which is basically World War III with operations in mainland Europe. The campaign begins with defensive missions. The initial goal is to stem the tide of the Warsaw Pact. You'll mostly need to hold your ground against wave after wave of enemy vehicles. If you're successful, the scenarios will put your side on the offensive. You'll have to carefully devise your moves on the map in order to reach the various objectives assigned to you. Terrain is a very important factor. Central Europe is mostly plains, but also marshes, rivers, and hills. 
The latter are absolutely paramount as tactical objectives, whatever your assignments. They offer you very good protection if you position your units just behind the crest, so they can fire without being seen by their opponents. Ridges also provide a commanding view over the battlefield. Hills must become waypoints in every route to your objectives, and you should choose your course according to them. As you move on to your objective, it's important to put your tanks into adequate formation. Your platoon can travel in a line, column, V-shape, wedge, or diagonal. You need to choose the most suitable formation according to enemy position and make extensive use of the smoke generators to cover your advance. You can issue orders to individual tanks or to your entire platoon, and boy, there's a huge number of available commands. As Computer and Video Games Magazine puts it, constant flipping between the tank crews and map screens requires intense concentration. That's absolutely right. Things are moving fast, shells are flying everywhere, and there's no respite for your eyes and your fingers, which need to constantly push keys all over the board. The DOS version allows the use of a joystick, but not the mouse. And since back then PC joysticks were not a common thing, the keyboard was often your only friend. Changing viewpoint. Giving orders. Switching between infantry shells and armor piercing. Activating infrared sight or magnified vision. Laser finding. Aiming. Firing. Moving, there's no break for a platoon commander. With up to 16 friendly vehicles and any number of Soviet ones rumbling around and firing at each other, you'll need steel nerves to avoid issuing frantic or contradictory orders to your bewildered units. The split between the map and intake view makes the game initially hard to grasp. Swapping between vehicles when giving specific tanks individual commands proves disconcerting. The classic mistake of the rookie player would be to try and micromanage everything. He easily forget he's in charge of an entire platoon along with its supporting units. Yeah, sure, action is more intense from a single tank point of view, but if you spend all your time like this... You won't go far in the campaign, unless you're playing against second-line troops. The more experienced player will make more use of the tactical map screen to set up complex maneuvers and flanking attacks, controlling not only his tank, but his entire platoon, and beyond putting himself in the role of the overall company commander. Once you're carefully planned the course of action and issued the necessary orders, you can relax a little. Only, then, when everything is on track, you should put yourself into any of the four M1s under your command and into any of the four crew positions. M1 Tank Platoon has a long-term appeal. 
It requires you to persevere in learning all of the game mechanics. All the controls must be mastered before you can get to grips with tactics and, ultimately, grand strategy. Simulations have to be accurate and M1 is spot on, but there's too much in it for impatient players to cope with. This relative lack of instant appeal marks it down as a game for military buffs rather than for your everyday tank driver in the street. But if you belong to the first category, as I did when I first played the game, then you'll have your fill. After a few hours playing this outstanding game, it becomes obvious that even the most avid player will find enough to keep him going for a lot longer than your usual simulation. So, if you're looking for seriousness and realism, and if you don't mind spending a good while learning how to play the game, then M1 Tank Platoon is your master choice. Back in the day, several U.S. Army officers praised the game and its documentation, saying, for instance, that it was the first serious tank sim available. As a game magazine puts it, Micropose Games uses significant techniques, excellent design, and amazing documentation. This makes for some of the best simulations to grace the home computer market, better even than many professional military sims. In 1990, Computer Gaming World magazine named it Simulation Game of the Year and ranked it in the 50 best computer games of all time. In 1991, PC Format did the same. M1 Tank Platoon sold 400,000 copies worldwide.